It's time to take a ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive with our co-hosts, Alan Saunders and Zachary Smith. Welcome into another episode of Steelers Afternoon Drive. I'm Zachary Smith. That is Alan Saunders on his afternoon drive on a feel-good Friday. And I feel like I should emphasize the fry part of that Friday, Alan, because something that we've been waiting on finally happened today. Pat Fryermuth has set an NFL record uh, by being the first tight end in NFL history to uh, have a contract where he makes more than the entire quarterback's room combined. <laughs> is that really an NFL record? Do we know that for sure? Or is that... I mean, it has to be, right? It has to be. It has to be. Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I mean, Ditka hey, did it. it. I don't know. Maybe Ditka, mm. you know, like way, way back. But uh, certainly not in modern times. As uh, That's certainly it. So even Russell Wilson is like, yeah, Pat, you're you're buying dinner next time we go out. Uh, right. With this deal, got a new uh, four-year extension. Uh, 48 million. I'm not sure exactly what that's going to do to his cap hit for this year because I haven't seen the the breakdown. It's a little bit more money than I thought it'd get. You know, I thought it'd be somewhere around like a 440, 20 million guaranteed. I think, you know, I saw a report from Jerry Dulac that it's around 23, something like that, guaranteed. Um, mm-hmm. With an $11 million signing bonus. So that means that there's this is really like the signing bonus obviously will all hit the cap uh, over the, the, the five years, but we'll get paid this year. Uh, he'll have though next season. I mean, I, I think that's probably like his entire next season salary will be guaranteed as well. Um, just with some back of the envelope math there. So that's really two years guaranteed. And then three more on top of that uh, without a guarantee. It, it's 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 kind of a I think it's an interesting deal for both sides because um, I think Firemuth is kind of betting on himself a little bit and the, just the fact that there's not a lot of future guarantee there beyond the second season. Um, but you know, I, I think the Steelers are taking a risk on him as well, uh, just because this is they're paying for potential. Really, they're not paying mm-hmm. for yeah. proven um, value, right? Like he has not yet played to the dollar amount that this contract suggests he should be able to play to. Yeah. And we talked about them, you know, maybe going in with that bet, doing this now because of what he could do within this offense. Like we've had that conversation on here multiple times. So I understand it for sure from both sides. I mean, I, you know, going back to the spring, I knew that he wanted to get this thing done. Um, like you, I didn't know that it would be this amount, uh, but I'm certainly happy for Pat. And yeah, from the Steelers side, I think it's, you know, based on potential, but I don't think it's a bad bet for them to make either. Like uh, when we t- have talked about what we think he's going to do within this offense, like I think this makes sense from their side as well. Yeah, I think it has more risk than say like the Cam Hayward extension, right? Where there's oh, just like, yeah. mm-hmm. like this is yeah. going to either be great for the Steelers or they'll get away from it for nothing. And there's, there's like, mm-hmm. no risk to it whatsoever. This one has, like, a little bit more risk for the Steelers. Um, that, like, if he's not healthy or if for whatever reason, like, he doesn't produce the way I think he's going to. I think this is going to work out. I think this is a good deal for, for both sides. I think it's a good deal for the Steelers. Um, and, and I just think, you know, really the sort of untalked about part of this is, like, the Steelers just have a lot going on right now. I don't think Pat Farmer is the best tight end in the league, but – like I think he's good enough to want to keep, and and like do they don't have enough of good enough that they to to want to keep going around. Like like we're talking this off season already. Like they're probably not going to have Najee Harris on that team beyond this year. Like so they're going to have to take care of running back, uh, the, Dante Jackson on a one year deal, uh, Landon Roberts on a one year deal. Uh, you know, do they have a future defensive tackle to eventually replace Cam Hayward and Larry Ogunjobi? They only have one guy. I don't think they have two. So, like, there's there's just so much that they need to do going forward anyway. It just felt like tight end – like, was there a scenario – is there a team scenario where, like, this isn't a good deal for the Steelers? Maybe. But, like, just where they are, like – they need so much going forward as it is. Tight end did not need to be added to that list. Yeah, and I was talking with uh, you know, a friend of the show, Nick Faribault, about this. 
And he pointed out to me some cases where we've seen tight ends break out later. Uh, when I say later, I mean, Pat's only 26, like still, he's not an older player. Um, but within this age range, like, look, that took Evan Ingram going somewhere else to do what he's done with Jacksonville. Um, you know, a guy like David Njoku in Cleveland, who last year kind of just became like a legit weapon for them after people were calling him a first round draft bust. So I think that there's also some cases of guys getting in better situation. And while the team hasn't changed for Pat, the logo hasn't changed. I think that he's in a much friendlier offense for the position that he plays and that breakout stood still could definitely be within there. Going back a, a few years, but Greg Olson, you know, he was a good player with oh, the Bears, yeah, yeah. but then he got mm-hmm. to Carolina and he really took it took it a step forward. Yeah, absolutely. So there's certainly cases of that happening as well. Uh, and on a personal level, I'm just super excited for him. And I know how much this is weighing on him heading into the season. So I'm glad he was able to get it done at least uh, 48 hours before we kick off and not taking it exactly down to the wire. Um, but yeah, so so credit to him as well, because I think that he also uh, just speaking on as a fan perspective from this that I can appreciate handled it in a very great way. Like you don't see people handle it all the time like this. Like he didn't miss anything. He was there. He was around the team for everything while this was going on. Very quiet about the situation. Uh, And I think a lot of people in the fan base can certainly respect that aspect of it as well. Yeah. I thought people were like a little bit unnecessarily prickly toward Cam Hayward, but even like, I have to like say that like, if you look at the way some guys have handled their contract situations, both here and around the league, Man, like I think, I think all class from from Pat Fryermuth, and I think there was always a good sense from everyone that the sides were not particularly far apart. That this was going to be a deal that was going to get done. Like sometimes mm-hmm. those things happen because it looks like a player is not going to get what he wants, and then he feels like he has to use the leverage that he has. Whereas I, mm-hmm. I kind of always thought this was going to happen. I'm actually a little bit surprised it took as long as it did. I, I thought it would have happened over the summer, but. Uh, I think mm-hmm. Pat's agent earned himself a nice little bonus here because I think I think <laughs> yeah. that delay ended up uh, adding a few more dollars to this deal for for Fryman. Yeah, he came in at, at, like in terms of where he ranks amongst tight ends. Uh, he actually got above Schultz. We kept talking about is he going to be in between Schultz and Fant somewhere within that range, at least. But you know, on the APY, ends up jumping Schultz there. Um, but you know, I know. Yeah, I don't know was, how that'll get co- like because actually, it's a five-year deal. So like, I, I don't know. Like, I think if you go, go back and oh, look, like, yeah, 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 yeah. To, you're gonna have to add the, this year into it. I'm not sure. So on the extension mm-hmm. money, it's twelve point one per year. Yeah. But but like, I don't know what that does to it. If you, I haven't done the full math yet, so it's it's like, what's the five-year total? Is only like fifty million. Right? Yeah, because he would have been like the cheapest starting tight end in football this year. Right. So yeah, I think he's actually going to come out to like about 10 million a year on the five year deal, which would actually make him 11th. But, I, you know, all those sort of things are like, it really just depends on how you want to do the math. You know, like, is it sort of splitting hairs to call this a new contract versus a five year extension? It's it's basically yeah. or, or a five year new contract versus a four year extension. You know, yeah. how how you want to do the math. Well, the only reason that I was saying that anyways, though, was just like within the same kind of ballpark in terms of where he was going to rank amongst tight ends that we were talking about. But That's yeah, the is. number itself is, is higher than we expected it to be, you know, total. So, um, yeah, like you mentioned, shout out to Kyle as well. Um, anything else on Pat, the extension, anything like that before we dive into other things? No, no, I think that's. Pretty well. Uh, you should you should uh, take this opportunity to pimp uh, your interview with him. Oh yeah, I mean I I, I mentioned that this was going to be happening, but for anybody that uh, is familiar with the other podcast that I do around the four one two, every Saturday we're launching a new show called Steelers Saturday Sit Down. They're typically going to be live streams on Saturday, but this specific one before week one, sitting down with Pat Fryermuth, fresh off of signing this extension. For the first episode, the launch episode of this thing, going to come out tomorrow at noon. Very excited about that. So be sure to check that out. Um, but Alan, you mentioned within there about Russ and saying that uh, he could take them to dinner and stuff like that. It's, they just went to dinner, the offense, last night. So if they got this extension done prior, maybe that would have been able to happen for the guys. Uh, but it didn't. So, you know, wasn't on Pat's tab, at least for this time. But I want to talk about Russ. 
because listed as questionable. We talked about the calf obviously yesterday, kind of took us by you know surprise that there was either a setback or something had to, that happened there with that calf injury that he's been dealing with. Uh, so he's listed as questionable, but Alan, I'll, I'll be honest, like just and this is you know you don't. I'm not saying that you agree or disagree with this. You can add your own thoughts. I'd be very surprised personally if it's not Justin Fields that starts this game against the Falcons. That seemed to be the prevailing sentiment uh, in the media room that I just left as well. I think I'm a little bit more cautious about okay. like proclaiming something. Like Russell Wilson is a 13-year veteran. He does not mm-hmm. need to practice on Friday to play on Sunday. I think sure. if he is – my thing is – like. You know, and, and obviously he's not going to answer, and so I couldn't get a, get a straight answer about it. But like, what are the chances that he is healthy on Sunday? And by healthy, I mean like approximately at his full abilities. You, you know, like that. Like, because if he is, then I think he'll probably play. I just don't know how to handicap how likely that is. You know, and how you, and how possible it is to go from I mean his quote today about what he didn't practice was not much you know they listed him as limited I yeah. among the the more limited limiteds let me just say that like and so I don't know that doesn't feel particularly likely to me I mean when he got hurt it was like three weeks before he, he was, it was back in practice originally now he's going to have yeah. to do it in three days if he wants to play in this game like that just that part of it doesn't feel very likely to me and then mm-hmm. then the other question is what will mike tomlin do if russ is cleared but is only like 75 percent? yeah right like, i think that's a question that i don't feel like i know the answer to um i know what i would well do. that stinks because I, I was going to ask you okay well that yeah because i was going to ask you what percentage would russ have to be at to play in this game over justin fields i, I don't know that answer if he's 100 percent, i'm sure he's playing yeah uh i just i don't know i don't think that's very likely and i don't really know where that line is for mike tomlin you know he said a lot of things uh when he announced that russell wilson was the starter about like how this is a very difficult decision and you know said he has faith in justin fields if so, then you wouldn't think that that number would be particularly, you know, you would think that like, oh, well, if, if we think these are, guys are really close, then Russ at 80 percent is not good enough. But I, I don't I don't really know. You know, I, that's I, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah. Well, you said, you know what you would do. So, yeah, what is that? Yeah, I would not be playing Russell Wilson at much less than 100 percent. He is already not as mobile as he used to be this is mm-hmm. not a very good offensive line and i think the last thing you want is wilson being unable to protect himself like yeah, he has right. to be able to move well enough that he is not going to get hurt in another way i'm not worried about him aggregating aggravating the calf so much is that if he can't move well enough to protect himself then in my mind he can't play uh, and this offensive line is going to give up pressure in this game like i'm fully believe that and so mm-hmm. i think um i think i would lean toward playing justin fields if wilson is not you know healthy enough to look like himself but i i mean i don't think i feel great about that either like i mean you know, i think like this is not good for the team like <laughs> just like like I, you can have a good backup quarterback, and it's still not great that he has to play. Week one, literally yeah. right out the gate. So I start like this thought entered my mind too, and you know you could tell me that I'm I'm crazy or whatever. But what if Justin does go out there and play better than anything that we've seen him do so far in a Steelers uniform? Team wins the game. He plays really well. Like, can you immediately just turn that back over? To Russ, I think it, depending on health, probably. But I, you know, I, I I'm, I'm, not, I'll just. I, that's an interesting scenario. I don't think it's particularly right. likely. It, yeah, absolutely. That's I'm not predicting that to happen. I don't think that it's a yeah. outcome that I would think is likely. I'm saying in the 
like scenario where that does happen, a very small percentage where he does go out there and play the best ball we've seen him because we haven't seen him play very good in his time with the Steelers, whether it's been, you know, practice, you've obviously seen him going all the way back to the spring into the summer, three preseason games. We haven't seen it yet. If we do see it in this regular season game, I- I'm curious to see if the conversation changes. I think the, I, I think I'm, I'm more concerned about the opposite. Like, okay. So we talked a lot about how you know they are going to want to make a decision about Justin Fields future at some point this season. And like, Man, it's not a very good position to put him in to be like Thursday before week one. Here you go. You're playing against the Falcons with a banged yeah. up offensive line and like a brand facing a defense that we don't even have any tape of. <laughs> like, like, good luck. Yep. Here you go. Like, yep. what if this is all we get to see of Justin Fields this year and it isn't very good? Mm. Like, does that, like, yep. does that write him off for 2025? Like, I just, I, I don't think it's a very good situation to put him in. I would, I would, I am more of the mindset where I would be cautioning people not to read too much into what happens in this game negatively than I would be worried about, oh, what are we going to do if Justin Fields is so good you can't put him back on the bench? Like, I, I mean, certainly it's plausible, but I, I those, those are champagne problems there. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, but you mentioned the state of the offensive line too. And I was kind of thinking about that. People have brought that up to me. Like, because of obviously Russ's calf, is he going to be able to protect himself behind this offensive line that not only isn't that good, but also you have at least one tackle that's going to play in this game that's a bit banged up in Broderick Jones with the elbow thing that he's been dealing with. That's limited. By the way, him. we can I like, can semi definitively say that the offensive line will be Dan Moore, Spencer Anderson, Zach Frazier. James Daniels, Broderick Jones. Yeah. Even though Troy yeah, Fontano I, I did not have much. an injury designation, that those are the mm-hmm. five. Well, yeah, I guess the, the you know the positive there is that Troy will be available to them in some capacity. Uh, you know, if he has to be, obviously you would like to not have another injury where he has to step in or anything like that. But I guess it's, you know, the arrow pointing up for the knee injury that he's been dealing with. Not saying he's at a hundred percent, but if he's good enough to be available to them. Yeah. I mean, it's good that he's been cleared. Right. But I, I mean, I think we, we said yesterday and lots of comments on that video uh, from yesterday as well. And I, I kind of – there's some people like, it's, he stinks. I'm like, no, he's just hurt. And they calm down. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't look great. And so I think there's right. there's probably another couple weeks of, of warm-up for Troy Fontana before we get to the real thing. Mm-hmm. I, I agree, though. I don't know if I even said this throughout the entire time talking so far, but I agree with starting Justin Fields if Russ is going to be limited by that just because of like his ability to protect himself. You know, I, I think that Justin's athleticism will at least get him out of some situations that Russ isn't going to be able to uh, with the offensive state of the offensive line. Yeah, I do worry like about like it's interesting because yes, Justin is very elusive, but Justin's also mm-hmm. a quarterback with like relatively poor pocket awareness, like doesn't make quick decisions. Oh yeah, his internal clock the, is and yeah. turns the ball over a lot. So like it's not like just like, oh, he's fast, so play the guy. Like the, the offensive line falling apart to me is more of a reason to want Russell Wilson in there. But I just – I don't want – I would not want him to get hurt because he cannot right. protect himself. Like at least Justin mm-hmm. Fields can take the sack. Uh, yeah. But like right. Justin in big In not, big picture, I agree. Yeah, he's not good at dealing with the pass rush. Like that – despite mm-hmm. being very fast, that is actually the thing he's probably the worst at. Right. In big picture, I agree. I'm not saying like the athleticism makes up for it at all. And like, if all things no, were equal yeah. health wise, then I'm starting. Yeah, Justin I just have just seen like a lot of people saying that like, oh, no, it's the other way around. Like the worse the offensive line looks, the less you should want to play Justin Fields because he's not very good with free rushers in his face and that kind of thing. 
Yeah. Yep. There's been plenty of evidence of that. Uh, you know, and that's one of the things that we knew about already and we hope that can improve uh, in his time in Pittsburgh. Uh, some other injuries that I wanted to bring up, though, uh, we already knew that, that Sam Allo wasn't going to be available to them. Logan Lee also out for this game. Uh, and Roman Wilson not going to play in this game. Um, do you think is, is that still because of the ankle, you think, or it was like he was going to be a scratch anyway? So, like, what was the point? I mean, I think it's still the ankle. He was very limited okay. again in practice today. There's some video up one of him catching some passes from Russ, like off to the side, but he, he wasn't. Uh, if Russ wasn't doing much, then Roman was doing like only a little bit more. And uh, I would say that, you know, he's, he's not going fully yet. Um, so I think it's still health at this point. Doesn't seem like he's far away. I would think. Mm-hmm. Champion plays next week, but and again, I don't really expect the first, you know, as soon as he gets in there for him to make a big impact anyway. But I think, you know, for this week, certainly, I think you're going to see Ben Skoranek up. I think he's going to be a contributor yeah. on special teams anyway. I, I think that may be a 53 man move. I, I, I don't even think that's going to be a practice squad thing. I think there'll be some kind of transaction to get him I, on the roster. I, would. I just, I just yeah. see a special teamer that is too useful to imagine not wanting him for more than three games this year, whether Roman Wilson is available or not. Roman Wilson's not going to play special teams. I, I think um, Skoranek is. And and so I think he'll be – I think mean, whether it happens this week or not, and they have plenty of easy ways to make roster spots. Like Logan Lee and Isaac mm-hmm. Samalo can both go to the IR fairly harmlessly at this point. And so I, I think he will probably find his way to the 53-man roster here directly. Yeah, I agree about the special teams value too, because I think if you were looking for just a receiver, like I wonder if Brandon Johnson would potentially be the guy too, but you know what's going to up. contribute. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. Like you think for the, you mean for this game specifically or just in general? Yeah. Yeah. For, the, for like, this week. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. Like they, like they could promote Skoranek to the 53 and elevate Johnson from the practice squad this week. That's not, that's mm. not crazy. They only have, they're only going to yeah. have four healthy wide receivers on the active roster. I, I don't expect them to play a lot of multi-wide receiver sets anyway, but you've got to have more than mm-hmm. four. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, positive news. Jalen Warren, Corey Trice, both going to be good to go for this one. We already mentioned that Troy Fatanu would be cleared, but he's not. You don't. we don't expect him to start in this game. But Jalen Warren, Corey Trice, both good to go. Yeah, and obviously don't expect Corey Trice to start either. I, he would right. work in the dime. Um along with Peyton Wilson. And then uh, Jalen Warren, I think you, you're going to see, we talked yesterday, he, he's returning kicks. So, like, I was I was pretty pretty uh, bullish on his chances of playing in this game, and he said he's good to go. So, Darnell Washington, I would say. So, there's, um, those, those guys are all in. So, some good news. But, uh, yeah, beyond the quarterback, I mean, I think it's pretty much as, as I expected coming into the week – except for that little blip with Washington there. So now that we have a bit of a clear picture as to what this is going to look like, I want to turn our attention to this matchup. What are you looking forward to in the Steelers and Falcons? Like, is there certain matchups that you're thinking about or where are you at with this game right now? I'm all right. So can I be like perfectly honest here? I'm flying to Atlanta tomorrow, four o'clock, something like that, Mm -hmm. four 30, getting in around six. And there's this place by the Atlanta airport that I had dinner last year. It's called Spondovitz. I had never heard of it, but it was right by my hotel. And I walked in and like on the walls, like pictures of like Ludacris and Cat Williams and like every like famous Atlanta celebrity. I'm like, okay, I'm in the right place. And Mm -hmm. I ordered a bowl of gumbo and some deep fried lobster tails and sent me back probably like 75 bucks. And I, I wanted to go swimming in that bowl of gumbo. And uh, that's and it was big enough that I might have been able to go swimming in it. And that's what I'm looking forward to right at this moment. I uh, can't get that one out of my head. That's, that's, the about, that's the matchup. That's the matchup you're looking matchup. forward to. Is Alan yeah. Saunders versus that gumbo. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a win. <laughs> I'm a win easy. Going away. Uh Credit card is not not going to win, but I'm I'm gonna. Uh, about Sunday, what I'm looking forward to 
is no. I'm looking forward to having some real football <laughs> breakdown. God, I just feel like it's been so such a long off season of nonsense that I just want some X's and O's in my life again. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I talked this morning a lot about the matchup between Kyle Pitts and this, this revamped center of the Steelers defense in terms of their ability to cover those guys. I, I'm really looking forward to, like the thing that stinks is that I from when I watch the game live, it's really hard for me to watch the line play. Um, I'm elevated and at an angle there in Atlanta, and it's just it's tough sometimes. So like, what I'm really gonna be looking for live though is like, can these wide receivers get separation? That's the one area where like I feel like I really have an advantage. The TV angle, you can't see what's happening downfield while the quarterback is standing in the pocket, not throwing it. Like, you don't really know why. You know what I mean? And so yeah. what I'm really looking for is, can Arthur Smith and this collection of receivers find ways, whether it's individually or schematically, to get people open downfield? Again, so I think is a very good Atlanta secondary, like Simmons and Bates and, and Terrell. Like, that. those are really good players. Yeah. Um I think that's a really good test. I'm looking forward to that. Can the line hold up? I mean, I think that'll be mostly just about, like, can they run the ball and can they not get whoever's playing quarterback killed? But, yeah, I think that's kind of what I'm I'm really – outside of what those other kind of things I've already talked about, like, that's the thing I'm I'm really curious to see what that looks like. You mentioned some of the key pieces of that Atlanta defense, and that's what I was looking to first before even thinking about the offensive changes they've made because they brought in Justin Simmons and Matthew Judon super late here before the season. And also their D.C. Uh, from last year, Ryan Nielsen, going to Jacksonville. So I'm interested to see what type of defense and how different it looks as opposed to last year because I thought they finally found a pretty good one. But obviously when you undergo the coaching change that they did, uh, didn't retain him. He went to Jacksonville, took on a new job. Uh, but it finally seemed like he was a guy that could dial up pressures after you know years of as a team having less sacks than T.J. Watt basically. So i uh, be interested to see how the pass rush is for Atlanta this year now getting Matthew Judon in there. Uh, and then on the offensive side, we've talked about it before, uh, you know, we're not necessarily super optimistic about what Kirk Cousins is going to look like post-injury. And uh, I just I want to see what he looks like running Zach Robinson's offense, who was a guy, uh, Zach Robinson, that very briefly was linked to the Steelers for the OC job. Well, it could have been, right? I mean, I think that was – it's interesting because if, like, if Raheem Morris doesn't get the, Atlanta, the Falcons head coaching job, mm-hmm. like they probably – like maybe Zach Robinson ends up with the Steelers. Uh, it's an interesting um, – Domino effect, so, yeah. And and then Smith goes to the steel. You know, it, it's kind of all connected there, right? And then uh, so uh, I think this this uh, Falcons defense is going to be really good. Uh, you know, you look at kind of some of the things the Rams did over the last few years. Jimmy Lake, the new defensive coordinator, and Raheem Morris both came from the Rams. Uh, Robinson did too. The whole coaching staff basically came from the Rams. Um, but I, I think like you look at kind of the stuff that like they did with Kobe Turner. In LA, and I look at Grady yeah. Jarrett, and I kind of feel yeah. like that's that's like one to one there. Um, but I don't really know like what Judon is going to be like in this because I don't really think the the Rams had a player like him. I'm really curious to see how they're going to deploy him and whether these tackles can handle it because I think that's that's a big part of it. But I'm expecting a low scoring game. I think I think both defenses are better than both offenses. I'm not enamored with the quarterback play all the way around. I think both offenses are better at running the ball than they are at passing. Um, so uh, I, I think uh, I think we're in for a low scoring game. Um, we'll see how it goes. I mentioned, I don't know, you know, sometimes because of doing like eight podcasts a week, uh, I'm like, did I have this conversation on here or was it on a different one? Um, but there was like three matchups that I was thinking about in my head. And we kind of touched on the Deshaun Elliott, Kyle Pitts thing, just because of, you know, the, the battles that Deshaun had with Pat and camp and lining up with tight ends. And you think he's going to see a lot of Kyle Pitts. Um, the other one I was thinking about, not because I think that like Joey necessarily will every week or has to follow receivers but like when you look at the body types of the atlanta receiving room like it makes sense for him to see a ton of drake london right because like darnell mooney no ray ray mcleod no you go further down the depth chart doesn't make sense so i'm not saying he's going to shadow drake london but i think he's going to see a a lot of him i think he should shadow drake london uh, most of the time 
Sometimes yeah. you can get like tripped up as a defense trying to do that too much. Like when like you know, motions and bunches and things like that. But in traditional alignments, I'd absolutely have quarter <coughs> shadowing uh shadowing Drake London. I I'm not I, I don't like I don't think Darnell Mooney's particularly good. I, I don't don't really like that contract yeah. for them. Uh, yeah, what is it like so, thirteen a year, something like that? Yeah, I, this felt like yeah. a lot for me. Um, and then, you know, the the slot guys. I, I think Ray Ray McLeod against Beanie Bishop is an interesting. Like, here's kind of a savvy vet who knows all the tricks of the trade against an undrafted rookie making his first start. I think that's. Probably not one that's going to go very well for the Steelers. I expect the Falcons to be able to, to – they're going to go right at Beanie early, I think, and kind of make him make enough plays that they feel like they have to get away from it. And I think that's mm-hmm. a tough matchup for them, for him. I think Ray Ray is probably going to get some. What about dealing with Bijan Robinson? What do you think the plan of attack will be? You know, I don't think Bijan Robinson is like – necessarily the kind of running back that needs like a special plan of attack. He's certainly a good pass catcher. I think keep Patrick Queen on him most of the time. It's That's a pretty good uh, in the offensive line. So you know you can't you can't get worried too much about what they're gonna do in the passing game. I think that's the real lesson there. It's like if they make Bijan a receiver, I think that's a win for the Steelers because um I I if I'm Atlanta I like I do not want Kirk Cousins throwing the ball 30 times in this game. Like, I just – I think they're going to try to to ease him into it. And um, so I think they're probably going to run a lot. I think we'll see a lot of Algier, honestly, just mm. because, like, stylistically, I think um, they're going to play a lot of 11. So I think the Steelers are going to be pretty light. Like, there's going to be a lot of Beanie in the game. And not only are they going to throw a Beanie, I think they're going to run at him too. Like, I'd be trying to put – Put uh, put Algier in situations where he gets one on one with a little guy like Beanie Bishop. Algier is a pretty, he's a pretty. I mean, he's not the biggest running back in the world, but he's a pretty tough runner. I think I like that matchup for Atlanta too. So, uh, I think there's, I think there are too many things in this game that I feel like are potential trouble spots for the Steelers. Okay, well that might take us into this because last thing before we get out of here, of course, we need a prediction. Yeah, I I think Atlanta's gonna win. I you know I I certainly the Steelers can win, but I just think there's the quarterback situation, the banged up offensive line. Uh, I thought this was a very difficult game to begin with. This Atlanta defense is mm-hmm. underrated. Um, I don't think the Falcons are going to be able to consistently move the ball, and I certainly don't think Kirk Cousins is going to pick them apart. But I think Atlanta has enough playmakers that they can hit on one or two. Um, I do think it's going to be a low-scoring game. I'm not sure the Steelers' offense is going to be do- able to do a whole lot besides run the ball. Um, and maybe they can get pickings free. I don't know. Um, I-, I just think to me this is – the, the other thing that we didn't really talk about that concerns me is that that none of this Atlanta team being on tape really puts a, mm-hmm. a Justin Fields at a disadvantage. Like Russell Wilson, you're not going to fool him. You know, he's been around forever. Uh, if, if the Rams come out, or yeah, Rams, Falcons go out and do some stuff, it's like, hey, this is not on the Rams tape. We just came up with it. This is all brand new. So, uh, like the turnovers could be flowing. I just, I think there's there's too many things that I see as matchups that, that the Falcons win. I'd feel confident. As far as a prediction, I do think low scoring, I'll say 20 to 17. Ooh, okay. Uh, so we made, I already made a prediction on this game on the, my other podcast around the 2 obviously. Uh, and this would have been before the whole Russell Will, uh, Wilson thing because we recorded that on Wednesday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Um, but I'm going to stick with the same thing. I know that turnovers can obviously play more of a factor with Justin Fields in there as opposed to Russell Wilson. Week one can go anyway. You know, everybody's still trying to find their bearings, figure out who they are as a team. Those two late additions for Atlanta, I think, could make a ton of difference. But how up to speed are they going to be? I'm going 23 17 Steelers. All right. Yeah. I th- but, but by the way, I do think Atlanta's going to be a very good team this year. I, I picked them to win the NFC South. I also 
I think they're going to win the NFC South. And I think are a team that could be a little dangerous. I don't know. They have a lot riding on Kirk Cousins, so I don't have a lot of faith in him. But I think that they're, they're consistently across the board the best team in that division. And nobody else there really scares me very much. Or I like really good defense. I like well. That's what I say is I like what Raheem can do for the defense. I also think that they have more talent on it than they have in in past years. Uh, and also, I know that he's a first time OC, but I really like the idea of Zach Robinson coming in there from the McVay tree and what he could potentially bring to I don't know mask limit, put Kirk in the most advantageous spots to still be able to get enough out of him. I don't know that he's going to be worth a contract yeah. when you're talking about doing that, but. That's just how I kind of feel about Atlanta's situation this year. Yeah, I think so, too. I, I think Robinson's a good offensive coordinator. And um, yeah, I think this is a tough matchup. I, I don't think I don't think a loss – like, we talked about people being negative la- earlier this week. Mm-hmm. People can be really yeah. negative if they lose this game. I, I don't really feel yeah. like they should be. Like, I think a loss is – like, obviously, I'm not saying, like, oh, be exciting because your team lost. But, like, I, this is not a bad loss if the Steelers lose this game. I agree. I agree. Now, the game against Denver, we'll have a different conversation about when we do our predictions and how They should be, be Denver by 50. Um, <laughs> don't don't spoil should... your prediction for next week. I haven't made it yet, but, like, that's – it may be – it may be in that range. I who do they have the week one? Jags? No, uh, no, no there's there's Seattle. They're Seattle. Seattle. At Seattle, first game the for Rust rookie Bowl. quarterback. Yeah, that's uh it's not gonna go well. Russell Wilson's two former teams going head to head in week one. Before, before one of them sees Russ. One of them sees Russ. <laughs> Russ can maybe watch because he may not be playing. But nobody does drama like the NFL. Uh, Alan, tell the people they can find you. At Ace Anders underscore PGH. PGH Steelers now. SteelersNow.com. You can find me showing my face in a bowl of gumbo tomorrow night. And then at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on Sunday. Looking forward to it. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, of course, here. Hit us in the comments with your predictions for Sunday's game. Of course, anything that we talked about as well in the episode or a question for a future episode, hit us with a five-star review and subscribe if you're listening somewhere else, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. You can find us there. Just search Steelers Afternoon Drive. Or you can also find us on TikTok, Steelers Afternoon Drive. You can find me everywhere, Zachary Smith, PGH. For Alan Saunders and myself, thanks for jumping in. Take another ride on the Steelers Afternoon Drive. (laughs) 